Dia de los Muertos is upcoming, I would read a short story before I read from my two novels. I'm probably only going to have time to read from one novel tonight. But because of that holiday uh, that is upcoming, I thought I would read a short story that was published in the Trinico Journal out of Indiana University Press. I don't have time to read the entire short story, but I'll read an excerpt for you. And it's titled, Pan de Muerto. After loading the last tray of Mexican sweet bread into the display case, it was 7 a.m. and time for FedEx to open for business. Conchas, whose shapes and sugary coasts rivaled the rarest colored seashells. Flaky orejas that looked like the ears of Goliath and empanadas de manzana that would win the envy of Jenny Appleseed filled the panaderia with a smell of golden caramel awash with the sentimentality of a home you never wanted to leave. The early morning aroma used to lure a steady flow of people, but over the last couple of years, business was slow for Pan del Corazon, Felix's 24th Street shop where each baked good reflected the storefront's name, bread from the heart. People like Socorro Prieta, Rudy Garcia, and countless others no longer came. They no longer lived in the neighborhood Felix had had called home his whole life. The Mission District of San Francisco is changing. New residents now occupied many of the Victorian flats and ornate Queen Anne buildings, dotting the historic landscape. Their palace demanded the avant-garde flavor, donuts infused with lavender and hibiscus oils and iced with lemon chiffon. Ice cream boasting large chunks of imported dark chocolate and flavored with orange cardamom. And bite-sized green tea cupcakes layered with mint frosting. Price was no factor for the newcomers. In fact, the higher the cost, the more people clamored for the chance to eat what they could easily afford and damn well thought they deserved. For all the customers Felix had lost over the years, he still had a few loyal patrons like Gloria Munoz. Nearly every morning she made her way to the panaderia to share space and time with Felix over a cup of coffee and pan. Felix was sure she'd be arriving soon because today was special. It was Dia de los Muertos, the day to commemorate the dead. And he knew Gloria would need to buy a loaf of pan de muerto, an offering to her loved ones who had already departed this world. It was noon before Gloria arrived. Where you been? You're late today. Damn arthritis. It took two coats of mentholatum to get my legs going. Is that what I smell? You could be a walking commercial for Vicks Vapor Rub. Ay ya, where's the sympathy? Gloria took a seat near the window where Felix met her with a cup of hot coffee and a custard turnover. Here, this will help. Where's yours? No appetite. Is it because of that? Gloria pointed to a business across the street with a grand opening banner hung over the front door. Felix answered with a voice of defeat. No entiendo por qué hacen eso. Gloria didn't hold back. There was fire in her tongue. What do you mean you don't understand why they're doing it? They want to run you out and they're going to steal your panaderia's name to do it. I looked into it, nothing I can do. Doesn't matter that we have the same name. Mine is in Spanish and theirs is in English and that's that. Did you talk to those new owners? I did, they won't change the name. Gloria sat pensively and then announced, I have an idea. Tonight I say we go over there and change the sign. It will read, bread from the heartless. <laughs> Estas loca, it's not, it's not crazy to tell it like it is, Felix. We're not young anymore, plus I'm tired. I'm ready to pack this show up. I have buyers for the place. Who? You know them? Ana and Tito Rosales. Gloria nodded. They have plans to turn this place into an art collective with a community center. I'm giving them a great deal with the promise they'll do good work right here in the mission. Ah, you're a good man. Gloria reached out her hand and grabbed onto Felix's forearm. What about you? What will you do? Felix softly brushed the top of Gloria's hand with his fingertips. He fondled her wedding ring, a simple gold band. I know you love Eugenio very much. I loved him still, too. Still can't believe he's been gone for 10 years. With no warning, Felix abruptly pulled his hand back and stood up. I should get back to work. He turned and started to walk away. Gloria didn't quell her frustration. What is it? 
If you have something to say, I want to hear it. I'm too old with little patience for whittling words from a man. Felix turned back. His eyes fell on a woman he had admired for years. Since the first day he met Gloria at a protest rally on the Berkeley campus, he knew she was destined to do great work. It was no surprise she became an attorney, not for big corporations, not for private interests, but for immigrants trying to secure a place in a new home. He panned, he panned over Gloria's face, one with features he knew better than his own. With his eyes closed, he could trace every wrinkle and each spot weathered by the sun. There had been times over the last decade when he'd allow himself to dream of slowly undressing her and then pulling her close so his fingers could travel the nape of her neck and gently sweep across soldiers that had carried the pain for those who couldn't. He moved down her back, one that had been resolute in its stance to define those living in the shadows. He ached to defend those living in the shadows. He ached to be her apprentice in a choreographed dance. It would begin with delicate movement and transform into a roaring tide that would split into hidden nerve tracks charged with high voltage current. Calmly and directly, he answered Gloria's question. We're in our final chapters, and I want to reach the end of the story with you. Gloria slowly stood and wrapped her shoulders in a bright yellow rebozo. There's a chill in the air. I'm making a pot of cocido tonight. It should be ready by seven. Can you pick up a bottle of red wine? Felix stood blank faced for six long seconds. The time it took for Gloria's words to register and for Felix's mouth to break open into a huge smile. Yes, yes, red wine. Good. Now I just need my pan de muerto for my altar. Gloria left the panaderia with her right arthritis pain in a distant memory, quashed by pulsating nervous anticipation. She had harbored feelings for Felix for many years, but didn't realize he felt the same way. Sure, in college they had a short romance, but that was years ago. Gloria is now an old woman, and for more than 40 years, Eugenio was the only man who had seen her, all of her. He had grown to love all of her body's imperfections, sculpted by the unforgiving and relentless hands of time. It didn't matter to him that Gloria's breasts could no longer fit perfectly into the cups of his hands. Regardless, Eugenio was gone, and Felix was a different man. Gloria felt insecure knowing her breasts no longer resembled the bright marigold orbs now adorning her altar. Instead, her breasts had transformed into saggy clumps that looked more like semi-melted queso fundido. <laughs> but as, the, as she made her way home, she battled the uneasiness. You can't eat marigold, she thought. And who doesn't like cheese, no matter what the consistency? <laughs> complete story, but time is pressing. Um, I've also written, as um, Scott mentioned, two novels. They've won uh, both a number of awards. And so I just wanted to read a little bit from my first one, Pick Behind the Bear. Both of my novels take place in 1971 in Los Angeles. They, they showcase a lot of LA history. Um, the first novel showcases the history behind the Chicano Moratorium. This is when basically 25,000 to 30,000 Chicanos took to the streets. And on that day, an LA Times reporter and newscaster from a Mexican station by the name of Ruben Salazar was killed. This story is about an LA Times junior reporter. Her name is Alejandra Marisol, who's been tasked with trying to find out why Ruben Salazar was killed a year previously. A lot of history. The second one is titled, The Water of Life Remains in the Dead. For all of you San Francisco Giants fans, you may be happy to know that there's a reason to hate the LA Dodgers. <laughs> Walter O'Malley, the owner of the Dodgers, stole land from Mexican Americans, <laughs> Russians, and Chinese Americans to make way for Dodger Stadium. It's a corrupt deal, and that history is in this book, as is the most egregious land grab, or one of them in the United States, was the taking of many parts of Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and what? California. And California. <laughs> <laughs> after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, after the Mexican-American War. So that history is in here. These are crime dramas, murder mysteries. I'm going to read you a little bit. 
I want to introduce you because I don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to actually sc scoot on down. I'm going to introduce you to one of my characters. Um, we, these books talk about some pretty um, hard things to digest. Um, this is where fiction kind of collides with nonfiction. So I created my own conspiracy about why Ruben Salazar was killed uh, because he was uncovering a sex trafficking ring that had to do with immigrants and their children. Um, and so um, I'm going to read you one of the characters that helps Alejandra um, unravel who is responsible for these horrific crimes. Alejandra has just been given an assignment to write a one-year commemorative piece about Ruben Salazar. She comes home to find her Thea Carmen sitting on the front porch. And Alejandra is staring because Thea Carmen is not wearing her prosthesis, her leg. As I moved in closer, I noticed Carmen was without her prosthesis, using her one foot to set her glider in motion. She caught my stare. Oh, mija, it's too damn hot to wear that thing today. To this day, when I think of those doctors who came into my room and told me they were going to remove my foot, ankle, and even more, I see fire. Diabetes is a terrible disease. You know I looked right at that doctor who spoke to me in her Spanish voice, and I said in English that her Spanish words didn't make it better. Lego Brianna, it all meant the same. I told them it was easy for them to take away my leg. My leg, my leg, not yours, I scream. And I go on, asking them how in the hell they thought it was going to sew and make money without my leg. They said nothing. Did they think my husband was going to pull himself together and help? A husband who ate in front of my frijoles and then walked through another woman's door to love her? I kept going, mija, but they just stood there and stared back. Their faces to me became blank sheets. I could make out nothing. No nose, no noses, no eyes, nada. I remember turning my head into my pillow and crying myself to sleep. When I woke up, they were all gone, and the next day, my whole leg, two weeks later, so was my mundo. I heard the story of Carmen's leg amputation and how mundo left her for another woman many times, but I never interrupted. I just listened and let her vent. She told me she ran into the two-legged woman with whom mundo was shocking up. And can you believe it, mija? That woman had the nerve to tell me when I ran into her at the buy right market that Mundo was happy and that she had found her home with him? I looked that tramp down and told her, you didn't find your home, you found mine and squeezed your ass all over it. 